The 2-1. Swung on, there she goes. Number 62. Move over, Big Mac. You got company. Here comes the hook. Got him. 20 strikeouts. He ties the Major League record. Unbelievable. And it was Kerry Woods coming out party and really my coming out party and sort of set the stage for the fact that the people in Chicago knew that uh, this wasn't just some legacy hire. This was someone who, yes, shared Harry's last name, but had a pretty good idea of what he was doing. And I'm grateful for that. Hey, Setup Nation, Kyle Stanley here with another episode of The Setup Man, and I know you're going to shed a tear today because it's the final week of our broadcaster series, I know. It's okay, you guys are going to make it through, but I'm really excited about this one today because we've already had Boog Shambi on, we had Matt Vaskersian, and then we had Len Casper, and today we have Chip Carey, the voice of the Chicago Cubs during some of the most pivotal years in 1998 and then again uh, lasting through about 2004. This was a time for the Chicago Cubs when you had Sammy Sosa and Kerry Wood and Mark Pryor and all these guys coming up. And that was really a time when I was a big Cubs fan. And to grow up hearing Chip Carey and then now to have him on my show is just a really special moment for me. But we went deep into especially family bloodline. He is the grandson of Harry Carey, who was you know famous for being the Cubs broadcaster for a while. He was also with the Cardinals for a decent amount of time too. Skip Carey, who's known for his days with the Atlanta Braves. And there's surprising stories to be had here with Chip and his father and grandfather. Ones that I didn't even know until I actually spoke with him, and, and he's going to share all about that today. But make sure that you stay to the end, because speaking of family, we've got some great dad jokes that I know you're all going to love and just going to be asking for more, right? Because that's what dad jokes are all about with Chip, and uh, it, that is going to be at the end. So make sure to stay tuned. All right, let's get to it with Chip Carey here on the Setup Man podcast. Chip, thanks so much for taking the time, man. Very excited to have you. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Yeah. So, hey, you are uh, you, you've been through... Uh, a little bit of a journey here with a lot of different teams, but now you find yourself with the Cardinals. Uh, but one thing that a lot of people don't know, a lot of people know that you are Harry Carey's grandson, but a lot of people don't know that you're also named Harry. You are Harry Carey the third. So my question is, where did the name Chip come from? Uh, Chip off the old block, the old traditional uh, cliched name. My uncle said I look like my dad. So Chip off the old block, that's where that came from. Uh, the interesting part of the story is my dad Skip. Uh, is also Harry Carey. He's Harry Carey Jr. And his maternal grandfather, uh, who also lived in St. Louis, his last name was Coons, uh, was kind of a jack-of-all-trades guy. He uh, ran a barber shop. He ran a saloon. Uh, but he was also a riverboat captain. And when my father was born in 1939, he went to the hospital and he presented his daughter and then his grandson uh, a riverboat captain's outfit. And he said, well, now he looks like a riverboat skipper. And skip is how my dad's nickname stuck. So his story is a whole, a whole lot more unique and a whole lot more original than the boring old chip off the old block. But uh, you can understand with your first name being Harry in these days, why you would want a, a valued nickname. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, and and I've learned a lot about you, not just from um, meeting you. Oh, man, it's been almost... 15 years ago, which is crazy to say, but, you know, just even and looking at some old podcasts here, I didn't realize, you know, just how um, detached you were from, from that side of your family growing up. You want to give a little bit of the background about that really quick so our audience can know just how you were able to come back to having a relationship with your dad and grandpa? Yeah, I think that uh, people have a, a misguided perception because they don't bother to ask that uh, I had a golden microphone placed in my crib and I sat at the knee right. of my dad father and uh, was basically um, bred to be a broadcaster. That wasn't the case in any way, shape or form. My grandparents were divorced. My dad and mom were divorced and I didn't really see my dad much after I was five or six years old. We'd have the, the uh, two week visitations in the summer and he was in the middle of his career doing Braves baseball. And so, um, you know, one day he left, I was five. And the next time he really saw me with any meaningful amount of uh, time together, I was almost 12 or 13 years old. And I had changed quite dramatically, quite obviously. And so, uh, uh, yeah, that was a really, really hard part of the job. He, he tells you is um, the, the personal failure of divorce 
but uh, leaving your children behind and having to go out and forge a career and build a family and take care of the family you had to leave, uh, those were all very, very difficult challenges for him. And so when I got involved in the business and had a chance to join him in doing this, I was well aware of the, the pratfalls and risks that that entailed. But it also gave me a chance to sort of re-knit and rekindle the, the familial relationships that were, that were severed. I didn't know Harry very well, uh, still don't. Uh, sadly, he's gone and we were supposed mm -hmm. to work together. And I'm sure you'll want to talk about that later. Yeah. But the best thing happened to me was leaving Chicago and going to Atlanta and getting a chance to be my father's son as a then 35, 36 year old man with children of my own. And uh, I've said all the time that baseball is a gigantic part of my life. It's a teeny tiny part of who I am, but I make no bones about it. Baseball's given me and my family everything. And for that, we're eternally grateful. That's awesome. I mean, I, I really do think that when you talk about people thinking you were handed a golden mic, you know, who, how else are you supposed to know that, man, you, you really just didn't even have a relationship with Harry. But like you said, you got ready to, to work with him in Chicago right before he passed. Um, did you get a chance to really learn from him? And do you have anything about your style today that you carry from him or is there really just a lot missing there from that relationship uh, to not even be able to to have learned anything? I got to know him a little bit, but not nearly as uh, to the depth with which I would have liked. I mean, look, I never got to ask my grandfather, what was my dad like as a kid? What was mm. his favorite color? What kind of a baseball player was he? Uh, how did you meet my grandmother? Those kinds of things are lost uh, to eternity. And that's, that's the saddest part of me not getting to work with him in Chicago. And yes, uh, that was the plan. Uh, I was hired. I was actually offered the job earlier. Couldn't take it. Tommy Brenneman did. Um, several years later, they came back and offered me the opportunity. And I called him and said, I can't wait to work with you. And a couple of months later, he died uh, in Palm Springs. So we never got wow. that chance. And so from a professional standpoint, hell yeah, that was a horrible uh, loss. I would have loved to have known what it was like to be on the train with Stan Musial every day. And what was yeah. it like doing games in Brooklyn and what did you think when you saw Jackie Robinson play and uh, why did the Cardinals almost leave St. Louis and why were the Browns more popular uh, for a while? Uh, those are all stories, baseball history stories that, that I didn't get to know, uh, not to mention the personal stuff. So um, like everybody else who thinks they know Harry, uh, I kind of watched him on TV. I was one of the Midwestern kids that would come home from school, turn on WGN, and usually the game was on in time for me to hear this crazy old dude with the big glasses sing, take me out of the ball game. And then I'd go do my own thing, finish my homework, and before I went to bed, uh, I would be able to turn on TBS and watch the, the Braves play the Giants or the Dodgers or the Padres out on the West Coast before I went to bed. But my relationship with my grandfather, and I call him Harry because he was more Harry than Grandpa, uh, and that's not what it meant disrespectfully. It just is, is uh, you know, kind of the way it worked out. Sure. Um, I knew him like most fans did. I could tell when he had a bad day or was having a good day. Um, but I didn't really know him anything more than a, in a superficial way until I started getting into business and got to spend a little bit more time with him. So break, break down for me, like what that's like watching your grandpa on TV and not having the relationship that's got to be was, really hard. it was weird uh, it was weird yeah. because that's your grandpa and look when people think of their grandpa they think hey we have thanksgiving we have christmas and we go fishing yeah. and you know learn how to drive and you, know, you get in the pickup truck and we go to the hardware store together that was my mom's dad for me uh that was not harry in any way shape or form and that's not a knock on him he didn't know how to uh, really be a parent or a grandparent his uh, mm -hmm. his family was a broken one as a child his father left him when he was very young uh, his mother uh, remarried and uh, died when he was in his, I think, before 10 years old. So he really didn't have that sense of uh, familial uh, framework set up for him. In fact, later in Harry's life, he finally got him a letter from his father from Europe. And he had been, become successful in St. Louis and it was addressed to him. And he apparently took the letter and threw it in the fire unopened and never read. So he never wanted that kind of Wow. Uh, relationship uh, to be rekindled because the sense of betrayal and, and loss that he felt was was very, very great. Um, I took a different path. Uh, you know, I took what I was able to to receive and I took it for what it was and never um, had any hostility about it. It was just uh, he was just a product of the times and a product of his circumstances. Uh, the hard part was, as you know, high school is the most difficult part of any kid's life. And when you have a quote unquote famous relative and then two of them that are on TV, and you weren't exactly the most popular kid in school, 
there were a whole lot of expectations and a whole lot of um, uh, burdens placed on you that probably, and, and, and admittedly so, wasn't uh, ready to handle. And that made it hard. Um, but people, I think, fell in love with the idea of Harry Carey and didn't bother to ask or know about the reality of what Harry Carey was as far as our family was concerned. That's not in any way to suggest he wasn't a loving, caring person. He was. He just didn't know how. And me being far away and uh, almost foreign to him, I think, added to that. You know, what's really interesting about this whole story is you have such a passion and love for baseball. I think it's really easy to look at this and say, well, given the way that you grew up and the the distance that you had, there would potentially be some resentment and not loving baseball. So why do you think you still gravitated and were magnetized towards still following that same path as Harry and Skip? Well, if you listen to my critics, it's because they'll say I'm a talentless hack. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, uh, right. No, yeah, no, no, the no, critics no. are always right, right? Yeah, well, no, I mean, I think we all gravitate toward, um, you know, what our parents do. Our parents are our role models well, mm. for good or for bad. And I think that's true in our family. I'm sure it's true in yours and, and just about everyone who's watching this. Um, you know, you want to uh, you want to make your parents proud. And the way that you feel like you can make your parents proud is to kind of do the things that they do. That's not necessarily do their career, but try to follow the the model that they lay down for you. And I think I've been able to do that. As I said, both the good and bad. There are a lot of things about Harry and my dad that I don't do. Uh, and I'm very much my own person. But I think that I realized very quickly I wasn't talented enough to be a, a baseball player. That was my dream. I wanted to play baseball like everybody who does what we do. We love the sport. We fall in love with it. And it bites us and it becomes our mistress, if you will. Uh, but I wasn't going to hit a curveball. I wasn't going to throw 95 miles an hour. And I wasn't athletic enough to play. So I learned very quickly I needed to find something else that captured my attention and, and kept me involved with something that I cared about very much. And luckily for me, my family and their business and the things that they did allowed me to peek behind the curtain, allowed me to sit in the booth and do stats and see how it was done and work on productions, uh, production teams at TBS when I was 13 years old, doing camera and carrying cables and uh, typing out graphics and doing stats and stage managing. I got a full education as a kid about how the business works before I even set foot on a college campus. And I think that was hugely instrumental to me. And oh, by the way, I saw how much fun my dad and Pete Van Weeren and Billy Sample and Joseph yeah. and Don Sutton and Ernie Johnson were able to have. And uh, as dim as my bulb is, at least it turned on and I realized, wow, this would be a great way to make a living. You can't play baseball. You can be around it and talk about it. And uh, fortunately for me, I've been able to do that. That's really awesome. I love that story. And and I know that you already touched on it, but back in 1998, right, you get the opportunity to work with your grandpa two months before the season starts. He suddenly dies. And now you are basically being put in Harry Carey's shoes. You're, you're Harry Carey on opening day in 1998. Talk about the pressure. Talk about the emotions of having to fill your grandpa's shoes without ever really truly being able to work with him. Uh, yeah, all of that was true. Uh, you know, when you go from being one of the guys to all of a sudden being the guy uh, at 32 years of age and not knowing Chicago and not knowing the Cubs and growing up a Cardinals fan and having to walk into his booth with his partner, with his headsets, with his crew in his stadium, his town, with his team. And oh, by the way, sharing the last name, it was a lot of pressure. It was tough because I think a lot of people were wondering, what's this guy going to be like? And anytime you have a different announcer pop into a booth, and I'm dealing with that in St. Louis, as is uh, my replacement in Atlanta, fans don't like change. And yeah. I, I, it's, it's, but it's part of the business. Change is inevitable. Uh, we're placeholders for these wonderful positions. And whoever follows me, I hope, will um, uh, go through what any announcer is, which is, wow, you do a great job, but it's different. It is different. I'm not Harry. I wasn't going to be. And you asked earlier what the best piece of advice he ever gave me was. It's the same my dad uh, gave me. To go into Chicago and try to sound like Harry Carey and do it might be, it could be, it is, and holy cow, and all that stuff. Say the names backwards all the time. Uh, would have been <laughs> career suicide because you yeah. have to prove who are you. And luckily for me, Arnie Harris, who, the late director and producer of the Cubs games, was a huge influence. Steve Stone, who still works in Chicago now with the White Sox, was an unbelievably great partner with me. And I think fans very quickly realized that I had the courage of my convictions to do it my way. Uh, and like it or hate it, I was going to be myself. And 
there were a couple of events that took place early in that season that really uh, um, uh, solidified that for me. The most notable was Kerry Woods' 20 strikeout game. Um, when we did that game, it was in early May. I think it was my 15th or 20th game. Uh, it's uh, maybe one of the greatest, if not the greatest game ever pitched, according to all the analytics geeks who, who, who keep track of those kinds of things. And I got to do that in the first month of my big league career with the Cubs. And that sort of set the stage for people saying, wow, that was an amazing feat. It was an amazing broadcast. Chip and Steve did a great job. We had all the shots. And it was Kerry Woods coming out party and really my coming out party and sort of set the stage for the fact that the people in Chicago knew that uh, this wasn't just some legacy hire. This was someone who, yes, shared Harry's last name, but had a pretty good idea of what he was doing. And I'm grateful for that. Talk about that game since you brought it up. <laughs> you know, every single year, right? They always have on uh, now Marquee, but it used to be WGN. You know, they have the anniversary. They show the the game. And we always hear about uh Carrie saying, Hey, you know, I didn't even throw a single strike in the bullpen before that game started. But what, what do you remember about that game? What's something different and unique that maybe fans don't know about during that uh, game? Or well, after? It, it, how differently we broadcast baseball now. Uh, yeah. We internet, we didn't have cell phones to speak of. Uh, we would carry around record books. Um, it was a gray, misty, crappy Chicago May. You know, they, the, the good summer weather doesn't start until June, usually in the Windy City. And we got to the ballpark and really not knowing what to expect. Kerry Wood was the number one prospect, a kid that threw hard, that everybody had been waiting for, that, you know, the Cubs always were looking for pitching and uh, they never really were able to develop their own guys, at least in recent times when I got there, to get to the major leagues and have any kind of success. And so nobody really knew what to expect. So he comes in and he starts throwing strikes. And we're marveling at his sliders dropping off the table. His fastball is 97 miles an hour. And the Astros – were the team he was playing. This was a really good Houston team with the Killer Bees, right. Gio, Bagwell, and Derek Bell. Uh, they were really, really good. And we just saw the strikeouts piling up. And we'd get the record books out, and they'd, you know, they'd find out, uh, well, that's the most strikeouts for a Cub pitcher in his first four innings and five innings. And uh, I had several people call me after the game who said they were out gardening, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, they were out doing their errands, and they came back, and we came back from – Commercial. It's the fifth inning. Kerry Woods got 11 strikeouts. And people go, what? 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 Well, they sat down and watched the game. <laughs> and so as the game went on, we just kept sawing these Astros hitters, not just missing the ball by inches, but missing the ball by, by feet. I mean, he just had unbelievable stuff. And uh, fortunately for me, the last strikeout of the game, uh, I looked in on the monitor. I saw the signal for the, for the breaking ball. I said, here comes the hook. He threw it. And uh, I think it was Derek Bell swung and missed. And history was made in Chicago. And it's one of the great trivia questions of all time. Who can name the catcher for the Cubs who caught Kerry Wood's 20 strikeout game? It wasn't Joe Girardi. It wasn't Scott uh, Service. It was a guy named Sandy Martinez, yeah. who, uh, who was the guy behind the plate, the third catcher that day for Chicago, who, uh, who did an amazing job. So it was one of those uh, just serendipitous moments that I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And as we all say, in the uh, the moment of the big moment, we just hope we don't screw it up. And luckily, I didn't. <laughs> oh, man, what a moment for you. Like you said, you're right around your 15th or 20th game. Was that just completely surreal for you to be able to call that? Yeah, because you don't realize the, 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 uh, the momentousness of it. Uh, as it takes place. As I said, we didn't have internet, so we're looking at the record book and, and, and furiously going through and finding out who had the most strikeouts in National League history, then Major League history, and then Cub history. And we're doing this in real time with the record book in front of us. And it truly was a book about two inches thick. We didn't have uh, the Google machine where you could type in most big league strikeouts in history. It, you know, you had to, we carried this stuff around. I know yeah. young fans imagine that that was the case, but um, it was fun. You know, it, the, 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 the pressure was the moment and the moment was fun, which made the pressure fun. You know, there's different kinds of pressure. There's bad pressure and good pressure. This was good pressure because we were watching something unfold before our eyes that, that we had never seen before in Chicago. And to do it with an analyst who was so pitching centric and knew what was going on and understood what Kerry Wood was trying to do was a real treat. And uh, the great thing about my partnership with Steve Stone was as his caddy, I could always hand him the seven iron and say it's 165 pin uh, upper right. And he'd hit the ball within putting distance of the cup. So uh, we just made great TV that day. And uh, obviously the reason it was great TV was not because of us. It was because the guys on the field and that guy that day was Kerry Wood. All right. Well, the $64 million question, should it have been a no hitter? 
You know, I go back and forth on that. I will give the uh, official scorer credit. He made the call right away. Kevin Ory was the guy at third base, and uh, it would have been a tough play. Um, you know, selfishly, would I have loved to have seen it be a no-hitter? Yeah, I, I would have. Uh, but, you know, Kevin, I, I think it would have been a miraculous play had he gotten it first. I've argued with Pat Hughes about that. Uh, in my heart of hearts, my initial thought was E5. Um, but I never played third base and I don't think I would even want to try. So <laughs> should have made the play isn't fair, but that would have been unbelievable had Kerry Wood gotten credit for the no hitter that day for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, there was a lot that went on in your first season in Chicago. I mean, not just Kerry Wood, but Sammy Sosa with the 66 home runs Cubs make it to the playoffs for the first time in 10 years. I mean, just when you think back about that first year for you in Chicago, what really stands out in your mind, especially as, like you said, you were kind of making your mark on the broadcasting world. The best thing a young broadcaster can have happen is when you go to a new market, you have a good team, right? I mean, but what a better entree for you than to show your chops and have fun and be successful. Instead of talking about 95 losses, you maybe talk about 95 wins. And that was the good fortune I had. Obviously, the Kerry Wood game got it started, but Sammy Sosa was pulverizing, pulverizing baseballs left and right. He was a 30-30 guy, and everybody knew he was on the cusp of being a great player, but nobody could have imagined uh, the kind of run that he was going to go on. The man hit 20 homers in June that year, 20 yeah. in one That's month. Crazy. There are guys who hit 20 all year, and to have a front row seat to that was a lot of fun, especially with Mark McGuire of the Cardinals, the Cubs' arch rival. Sammy would hit one in the morning. McGuire would hit one at night. Sammy would hit two on Wednesday. McGuire would hit one on Thursday and one on Friday to tie him or take the lead. There was not only a pennant race and a playoff race, but a home run race. And we had a front row seat to watch that. So uh, for, for me, 1998 was one of the most enjoyable and most fun years uh, from a baseball standpoint, because it was so unexpected. It was so fun. And there were so many levels to the excitement of a baseball season. And it unfolded each and every day at the corner of Clark and Addison. As you were becoming comfortable in Chicago, did you feel like you were becoming more of, hey, that's Chip Carey, not, hey, that's Harry Carey's grandson? I, well, I've always been that way. I've never walked around with my chest puffed out and said, hey, I'm, I'm the relative of this guy and that guy. Uh, I am very proud of, uh, of my legacy and my heritage and, and who I came from, but I didn't have a choice in that. You know? So, um, no, I, I always approach, I'm going to do this my way. I mean, that's the Frank Sinatra song, right? And um, as, as I told you, I, to walk into Chicago and try to be anything but myself is, is, yeah. would have been stupid. Uh, fans are smart. They can, they can sense a phony. They can sense when, when you, you, uh, a guy is not willing to let the mask down and share himself with the audience. And that's really all fans want, I think, is you to be a human being. And I think that was Harry's great success is he was a fan. He didn't broadcast the games for the suits, the players, the managers, the management, the umpires, the commissioner. He did it for the fans, the paying customers, the people that were paying the cable bill to watch the game. And if the team stunk, he said so. Uh, my dad did it in a very different way. Uh, my dad was a lot more subtle, maybe a little more snarky and cynical and, and uh, uh, intellectual. But it was the same. Uh, it was the same type thing. And I, I'd, I'd like to think I've shared a little bit of both of those traits. Uh, it's a lot more difficult, I think, to be as honest as we'd like. There have been uh, scenarios this summer that I think point that out very, very clearly, which is unfortunate. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, people forget that broadcasters are a brand, too. And our credibility in telling the truth is extremely important, because if you say things are, are great when they're not, people aren't going to believe you when they are great. And uh, credibility in telling the truth and being yourself are really, really critical factors in being successful in this business. And I'm very proud of the fact that I've always done that as my dad and grandfather taught me. Dive in a little bit deeper. You said you feel like you can't be as honest or it's harder to be as honest today as back then. What, what do you mean by that? I just think uh, the, the, you know, when, when Harry was doing the Cubs, if the Cubs lost a game and threw the ball away, he'd say, what a lousy ball club. Uh, my <laughs> dad would say in Atlanta when the Braves were losing 95 games, and it's 10 to 1 in the sixth inning. His famous line was, if you promise to patronize our sponsors, you have permission to walk the canine. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if a young broadcaster, even an old broadcaster, said something like that now, you'd probably get in a whole lot of trouble because of the the, the way the corporate mindset is. Any criticism of the product is a, is a uh, denigration of the product. 
And that's not the case. It is a product. Sometimes the product's good. Sometimes the product's bad. And I think that fans want the truth from the people that are representing the product. And uh, I think it's a lot harder, especially for younger broadcasters today, to be um, totally honest. And uh, that's unfortunate because I think the really, really great broadcasters have always done that. Vin Scully was as honest as they came. You don't have to bury people. and That's not my style. That was sometimes Harry's style, but not mine. But I think if you tell the truth with your people, ultimately they respect you. And I think ultimately the players respect it too because all they want to be told is the truth. And I think we're all able to handle the truth. One bad game does not make a bad product. But 100 bad games makes a bad season. And you've got to be able to say that. And the, the places that allow that to happen, like I'm fortunate enough to experience now in St. Louis, that's when the real magic happens. When something like Kevin Brown being suspended for – sharing stats comes out first of all what's your reaction to that and second of all does it make you just on edge about what you're allowed to say on air these days well i've been i've been in a place where that happens every single day and uh i was reduced to taking pictures of the game notes and storing those on my phone in case someone had a criticism or a problem with what i was saying uh i can't Typically to what happened with Kevin, all I know is that what you said is true. Uh, the team provided game notes were placed in front of him, and he made a, he made a comment based on a statistic, which basically was saying how much better their team was doing than yeah. in season. Uh, again, he's not saying, and, and, and I never said uh, as an opinion that uh, uh, something was happening. He was stating a fact. And that's what was so frustrating about it from a professional standpoint. He was stating a fact provided to him by a team uh, sanctioned part of the organization. It was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. It made the Orioles look bad. I feel bad for Kevin. I don't know him. Uh, but having been through stuff like that, it's not fun when you are forced to uh, temper your words and where facts uh, become uh, problematic. The facts are the facts, right? You're not, you're yeah. not saying the team lost 10 in a row because of ineptitude or bad management or dumb draft picks, you're saying they've lost 10 in a row to the Orioles or to the Rays or the Blue Jays because the team's ERA is over seven. I mean, the, the facts are what they are. And uh, as a broadcaster, you have to be able to be allowed the freedom to tell the story of the team, of the game, and of the season. And as I said, I'm really, really fortunate to be in a place where that's allowed to happen. You said you've had some situations where you feel like you've been close to being in his shoes. Is there any situation that no, I can... No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't say that at all. I just said okay. that uh, I just said that you know there are places that are much more concerned about um, positivity uh, than truth, and uh, I think uh, you know we all go to go to the ballpark trying to put the best possible shine on the product. Um, but there are days where the product isn't very good, and you've got to be able to say, hey, they went one for eleven with runners in scoring position, and the starter gave up seven runs in three innings. For Team X to get where they want to go, that's not acceptable. That's not where they want to go. They've got to be better. And I think there have been places where um, uh, that is said and and uh, it's not well received. Luckily, as I said, that's not the case where I am, so I'm happy about that. Yeah, that's great. I, I also feel like just as a fan these days, back when I was a kid in the late 90s, early 2000s, you knew – which broadcast you were listening to. Like you could tell, okay, if this was on WGN, you know, mm -hmm. Chip is heavy on the Cubs. You listen to a Brewers broadcast. They're heavy on the Brewers. Now today you listen and you're like, I can't, is this a national broadcast or is this a home team? Like, I can't really tell. Do you think that's a reflection of guys feeling like I, I can't really be as opinionated because I'm afraid of what might happen? I can't speak to that. I can speak mm -hmm. to the fact that there is a great deal of homogenization in the broadcast, you're right, in the old days, and gosh, that makes me feel even older saying that, you had no doubt who you were listening to. Uh, mm -hmm. Each broadcast had its own unique look. It had its own unique signature. It had its own unique sound. Um, this is not in any way, shape, or form of criticism, but we have uh, a broadcast entity that I work for that has the similar graphics package that's the same in Cincinnati and St. Louis and Arizona yeah. and Minnesota. And if the games look the same, many people think they're going to sound the same. And a lot of times you don't uh, hear the sound because you're out at a restaurant or a bar and the game's on. You see the closed captioning and you wonder exactly what you said. Well, who's doing the game? Um, as I said before, I, I, I've tried to teach my sons this and I, I, I respect Boog Shambi an awful lot uh, for this. 
he has his own unique sound. Gary Cohen and Keith Hernandez and Ron Darling in New York have their own unique sound. It's foolish to try to sound like anybody else. you got to be you. And the really, really good broadcasts, in my opinion, are the ones that, uh, that make that happen. Very cool. Going back to your family, like you said, you had two different stints, stints with your dad in Atlanta. Um, what was it like, especially for that second stint a few years before he passed, to be able to work with him? Oh, it was great. Uh, you know, it, it had been time to go in Chicago. They offered me a contract and it wasn't really that great. And um, the the Braves um, were really happy to welcome me back. I think their plan was as my dad got older and traveled less, he wanted to transition over to radio and they were looking for someone to sort of carry on, if you will, pardon the pun, um, what they had started. I'd been there before in the early 90s. So there was some familiarity there and I'd gone to Seattle and uh, Chicago with the Cubs. Uh, but to come back at that age was great. Rewarding personally. Yeah, I was married. My, I had young children. Uh, my dad got to see his grandchildren. Uh, he was at an age where, you know, I could help pick up his bags and we'd go to the bar after a game and have a drink on the road and we'd fly together and sit on the bus together and laugh. Um, you know, we got to spend a lot of great quality time together, both at home and on the road. And uh, what was really funny and unique about it was we'd work together and we didn't sound alike. We did the games very differently, but we never, ever jumped each other's sentence, ever. We always knew what the other guy was going to say, or we just naturally knew when the other person was done talking, and we were able to lead each other in and out of stuff, um, which made it fun. The only awkward thing was, what the hell was I supposed to call him on TV? Was it Skip or Dad? And it changed from day to day. I really couldn't come up with uh, a, a consistent answer to that. But to answer your question uh, more succinctly, it was great. It was a dream come true because I got to be with my dad. It wasn't hanging out with Skip. It was hanging out with dad. And I think anybody who does what we do, that's really all they want. So my question is, it sounds like there was a lot of pulling towards the Braves because of the emotional factor of your dad. Was there also this pushing away from the Cubs? You mentioned that the contract wasn't great. I know that there was a lot of weird things that went on in 2004 that could have created some sort of pushing out from the Cubs. Can you just kind of take me through what that year looked like in making that decision? Well, 04, the Cubs were a team that was put together and supposed to win the World Series. You remember in 03, it was the infamous oh, Martin yeah. game. They blew it in game six and blew it in game seven uh, and had their chance to go to the World Series and didn't. Jim Hendry did a great job of putting together a really good ball club in 04. But then Wood Pryor and Zambrano all got hurt, and that uh, turned into a disaster. They had a chance in September to get to postseason, but it was an uphill struggle pretty much all year long, and they just ran out of gas and and couldn't get the deal done. Uh, there was a lot of friction between the players and Steve Stone. I was kind of collateral damage in that. But again, to our earlier conversation, we were just stating facts and telling the truth. They weren't playing well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some of the guys on that team didn't handle it particularly well. Uh, and it got, it got, it got pretty ugly. Um, but that said, mm -hmm. I wanted to stay in Chicago. Uh, they offered me a contract. Uh, they they uh, told me I was going to come back in June of that year. And there was a, a time period where they had to execute a deal. They didn't. Other teams got involved. And when the Braves called, the Cubs had an option to either match the deal or they had to let me go. And they decided to let me go, um, which uh, turned out to be a blessing. Uh, would I have loved to have stayed in Chicago? Yeah. I would have dreamed of staying there, working with Steve Stone, and you know it would have been 30 years now, probably. It would have been 30, almost 30 years for me now, uh, had I stayed in Chicago. But uh, everything happens for a reason, and I don't. I never looked at it as a disappointment. I had a place to go. I had another great place to go, and I got to spend time with my family. Spring training was in Orlando, Florida, where I was living at the time, so that was a lot more convenient. And the icing on the cake was I was going to a team that was going to win a lot of games, and they did. And to, to work with Bobby Cox and Leo Mazzoni and Roger McDowell yeah. and all those great players was was an awful lot of fun. So I didn't look at it as, as a, uh, a, a chapter ending. I looked at it as, as a new door opening. And uh, I loved my time in Chicago, had a blast, learned a lot, grew up, uh, got tougher, which needed to happen, was disappointed certainly with the way that it was handled from their end. But that's life. That's baseball. And I was fortunate enough, as I said, to end up in a, in a great place. And uh, uh, don't regret it uh, for a minute the, the wonderful time I had in Atlanta. You know, I haven't been in your shoes in a professional standpoint but i have done games and i and i look back on those times and i think what a great relationship i had with those players where i was able to openly have conversations to use that as content while i was doing the games when you talk about having to be almost like a mediator or a middleman 
and creating friction amongst players. Did that make your job tougher knowing that the players weren't as open or willing to be as open with you guys just based on where things were at in 2004? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it isn't helpful. I think yeah. if we look back, both sides could have probably handled that a lot more, uh, 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 a lot better. Uh, I think, and, and look, time heals all wounds. Uh, they were frustrated and disappointed and embarrassed and they were hearing it from the fans and they felt like they weren't getting uh, backed up from their broadcast. And our, our response was our check comes from the same place your does, but I can't pitch it, catch it or throw it. If you want us to say things that are nice, you want the, the writers to write good stories, you got to play better. This is a performance uh, driven industry. And as again, as Harry would have said, the players are paid millions of dollars to win games. They are. And if they win, they get all the accolades. If they don't, well, then they've got to wear that. That's 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 kind of the deal that we all make. Uh, it gave us no pleasure uh, to talk about how poorly they were playing. But the, the funny part of it is, and it's always stuck with me, is the guys that chirp the loudest when things are going poorly are always the guys last in line to come up and say, hey, thank you for saying I, I won player of the week. Thank you for the right. three home runs called. Or thank you for saying hi to my grandma on her birthday on TV. And that's always struck me as kind of an unfair part of the bargain. Uh, you know, we're pulling on the same rope, but I don't have a chance at how the rope is uh, is uh, um, <laughs> how the rope is being constructed. And so, uh, you know, if you if you're going to critique our performance, that's fine. But you got to be the first guy in line to say thank you when we do something nice. You're now with the Cardinals. First, how much crap do you get from Cubs fans on Twitter? <laughs> oh, well, I'm not on Twitter, so I don't get any. You're not on Twitter, okay. <laughs> no, that's probably the best advice I can give a young broadcaster. Get off that cesspool. Don't use yeah, it. Yeah, that's uh, a good call. But, uh, but, you know, when I when I went to Chicago, I got booed a little bit, which was great. I can take it. I've seen the rivalry from both sides now. I took a lot of garbage when I was there because I grew up in St. Louis and was secretly a Cardinals fan, obviously. Was impartial for the 18 or 19 t games we would play head-to-head. -head. Uh, but, no, it's it's been great. The rivalry's been awesome, and uh, we haven't played as well as we would like this year. But, Going back to Wrigley Field and seeing old friends and being remembered by the fans as a Cubs guy, too, is is nice because, again, it means you did it the right way. It's a lot better going back to a place you worked and everybody happy to see you than say, man, we're glad you're gone. And luckily for me, knock on wood, that hasn't happened yet. What, what do you think has been the reason for the Cardinals season this year? I mean, you know, you just look at it as a fan and on paper, this was going to be one of the top teams, not just in the National Leagues, but in the Major Leagues. Being there every day, what do you see that has led to just really one of the worst seasons that they've had in, in what, a century? Yeah, the Cardinals haven't finished in last place, but once in 100 years. Uh, it's really simple. I think we overcomplicate the game uh, too much. I think it's really simple. They haven't pitched well enough. Uh, the starting pitching has not been good. Uh, the bullpen's blown half of the saves that they have uh, been given the opportunity to close out. They've struggled to get the big hit. Uh, the Cardinals have not hit well with bases loaded. This year, defensively, they got off to a slow start. They've been a lot better of late. Uh, they're using a lot of young, inexperienced players and force feeding them and getting them here on merit, certainly. But uh, th that's a challenge, too. Uh, it can't be Arenado and Goldschmidt every single day. Uh, they said Wilson Contreras, who got off to a very slow start. They gave him the biggest free agent contract uh, for a player outside the organization, and he didn't catch well, and it, it affected the pitching staff. So it's been a, a whole mishmash of different things that have uh, have caused this disappointing season for the Cardinals. But I think if you had to boil it down to one thing, it would be the pitching. Pitching's got to be better. It wasn't good enough. And I think they know that. John Moselock has said that uh, they're going to go out and try to get more pitching, pitching, pitching in the offseason. They did that at the deadline and tried to bolster the farm system and give them some depth. But uh, they've got to go get some guys who can get some swing and miss pitch deeper into games and fix the bullpen, which is going to be a tall order with so many teams looking for the same thing. But I think we're all confident they can do it. With you being, you know, a, a Cardinals fan growing up and coming back to broadcast for them, has this been a dream come true for you? Yeah. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it's it, well, a dream come true in that uh, I never imagined it would happen. 32 years cool. ago, the Cardinals offered me this job and I couldn't take it. Uh, Joe Buck and I were supposed to work together uh, wow. and be a tandem uh, back on an entity called Bud Sports, uh, both on radio and TV, and I couldn't take it. I was just starting Orlando Magic Basketball. I was 20, God, I was 20, 25, 26 years old and was starting uh, a new in Orlando and didn't feel like it was time for me to leave. And it wasn't a full season of games. It was just a handful of them. Um, so I, I, I couldn't take that opportunity. 
Uh, we all know the circumstances about which this job came open, and that's a tragic thing in and of itself. Um, but if the job was open and they were looking for someone and someone was interested, I chose me. And luckily, they chose me. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. The opening day this year was spectacular. My wife was there. Uh, it was the first opening day I saw as a Cardinal fan in person. I watched it on oh, TV. Cool. With the four tickets. And my wife was there and said, well, what, what, what should I expect? I said, well, you're going to see the Hall of Famers in red jackets and you're going to see them bring in the Clydesdales. Well, they did that. And on this beautiful spring day, everybody in St. Louis is standing and cheering and crying. It's truly a civic celebration because the Cardinals are a civic trust there. And that kind of reaction from the people even stunned my wife who said, this is amazing. And all I can say is this, the gratitude that I have for uh, the Cardinals bringing me back home, if you will, is immense. Uh, for the first time in 20 years, my wife looked at me and said, I'm really, really excited about our career because they've made her feel like she's a part of this. They've made her mm. feel like important and our family is important. They, uh, The DeWitt family has done such an amazing job at Valley Midwest, too, of making it about more than just the games. They really care about their people and they care about their people as part of their family. And uh, uh, the acceptance that we've received has really been humbling it's been heartwarming, and it uh, really makes us excited for not just uh, uh, the rest of this season, but what we hope will be an exciting 2024 and beyond. Well, we've talked a lot about your family, and before we get to our lightning round, I got one more family question for you. You've got a few sons that seem to be wanting to follow in your footsteps, too. How cool is that for you? It's awesome. My sons, uh, Stefan and Christopher Carey, they're the broadcasters in Amarillo for the AA Sod Poodles. They're terrific. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that they'll be major league ready, hopefully sooner rather than later because mom and dad want to <laughs> payroll. Uh, but as a, they're really good at their jobs, but they're even better people. And that's a credit to my wife, Susan. Um, you know, we're gone half the year and there's a great deal of, of uh, pride in what we do, but a great deal of uh, disappointment and, and sadness because we miss so much. I mean, I've missed half of my kids' lives because mm. I'm off doing a baseball game somewhere. Uh, and that they want to do this, well, they've jumped into this with eyes wide open. They know exactly what to expect and what it's all about. But they're extremely talented kids. Uh, I have an older uh, daughter who's uh, out in, in California, and she's acting and modeling, and she's into you know the the show business type stuff as well. And she's equally talented and gifted. And the scariest thing of all is I've got a 14, soon to be 15 year old who sits at home with the iPad and broadcasts the games too, and uh, <laughs> and is on his way to doing this stuff too. I'm oh hoping. My God. Are talented enough to be the one that makes it to the field. But if not, there's another one in the quiver for us. And uh, again, as a dad, I, I think that just means that our family's done it right. We're really proud of that. And uh, if they decide to do this, I just want them to be happy and 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 uh, energized and validated by uh, by their career choice, because that's really what it's all about. Yeah, and be careful. In like three generations, there's going to be so many carries that we're going to see every MLB team <laughs> broadcasted by a carry. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. Well, Chip, you ready for our lightning round? It's called our 27th out. Okay, let's give it a shot. All right, let's do this, man. Uh, what is one ritual of yours that you do before the game starts? Uh, make sure that uh, I've got my lineup card filled out the right way. I double check the lineups and I uh, talk to our producer to make sure we know what the heck we're doing before the open because sometimes we do it live and you never want to screw that up. That is a good thing to have set for sure <laughs> um who's your favorite player of all time oh boy well as a kid it was ted simmons uh as an adult watching chipper jones play was absolutely remarkable uh the guy was such a pro uh he showed up every day, every day hit 300 switch hit hit for power made all the plays defensively uh was great with me uh for whatever reason we hit it off maybe it's because of our nickname but uh, ted simmons as a kid chipper jones as a as an adult Awesome. What about favorite player now? You mentioned Ozzy. Ozzy Albies. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll put a caveat on this. Favorite non-Cardinal player, Ozzy Albies. I, I think the guy plays with such passion. He has so much fun. He's a glue guy. Uh, everybody loves him. It doesn't matter what color, co creed, language you speak. Uh, everybody's drawn to him. Uh, he signed a, a minuscule contract and was happy with it and still is happy with it. Uh, he's the guy that really allowed the Braves or one of the guys that really allowed the Braves to go out and build this, the powerhouse that they have. And uh, even when we're playing the Braves, I, I sort of secretly root for Ozzy Albies because he's one of my favorite people ever to have a chance to be around. Quick story on him. We got our World Series rings uh, for Atlanta in 21 and we were walking around and I had mine on that day. And I walked up to him and said, hey, man, I'm wearing this. And he said, I hope you don't think that I had anything to do with winning the World Series. 
And I said, I just don't want the guys thinking I'm, I'm an idiot for, for wearing this ring at the ballpark. He said, hey, you're a part of our team. We're all pulling on the same rope. You earned it just like we earned ours. Wear it with pride. You have no problem with anybody in the room. And if you do, let me know. How about that? That was pretty wow. first class in big league from Ozzy Albies. Yeah, and at such a young age too. That's yeah. really cool. That's that's yeah. a real big sense of maturity of who he's who he really is. That's pretty cool. Thirtieth yes, um, year career. Who's your favorite coach that you've ever interviewed? Oh, my favorite coach I've ever interviewed. I'd have to say Lou Pinella. Uh, Lou Pinella was uh, the manager in Seattle when I was out there. Uh, you never knew whether you were getting happy Lou, uh, subdued Lou, hungover Lou, or volcanic Lou. <laughs> Uh, it was a real challenge to do the interviews with him, especially after a Mariner's loss. Uh, but he's one of the most delightful people in baseball. Uh, loved the man to death. Uh, we were in Chicago when he had to, to step aside because his mom was in ill health. And watching him and Bobby Cox exchange the lineup cards at Wrigley Field for the final time with tears streaming down his face was really, really hard. Uh, Lou was a great guy. When I got the Mariner's job, he um, came up to me and said, your grandpa said I'm supposed to look out for you, so I got your back. Uh, you know, that was that was uh, emblematic of what kind of guy he was. I learned a lot about the Yankees and baseball and how to be a pro and how to deal with things from Lou Pinelli. He's one of my all-time favorite people and definitely at the top of the interview list. You are the eighth person I've interviewed for this show, and somehow Lou Pinella stories have popped up three or four times already. <laughs> so best. Ted, best. Ted Lilly had an amazing one about Lou coming out to the mound and Lou's fly is down. <laughs> Yeah, you have, you have to listen to that. That's him. That's him. I mean, Buck Martinez tells the story. Lou's playing high school baseball. He's hungry. It's a double header, and his mom and dad bring him a sandwich. He's out in left field. And he's eating a sandwich, and a fly ball comes his way, and he takes off. And there's pepperoni and tomatoes and bread and the wrapper. They go flying while he goes to try to catch the ball in the out. That was Lou. What he did. I mean, you just never knew what you were going to get from him. But it, what made him so fun is kind of what I said earlier. He was so genuine and so himself. You you couldn't help but but laugh and love him even when he messed up. We're going to have to get him on the show so he can share his own stories. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, what about uh, excluding your dad and grandpa, favorite broadcaster of all time? Uh, well, I mean, you look, everybody, I'm sure is going to say Vince Scully. He's our Shakespeare. Uh, he's, he, you know, there was, there's never anyone like him, never will be anyone like him. And with the way the game is played now, I don't think anyone will be allowed to be like him because time just won't allow the history of the game to be retold the way that he do it, did it. Uh, I grew up in St. Louis and a guy that doesn't get enough credit, I think is Jack Buck. Mm. Uh, Jack Buck was the voice of the Cardinals with my grandfather for a lot of years. And when Harry left after the 69 season, Jack Buck took the reins and really helped build the culture of the way Cardinals baseball uh, is broadcast now. He and Mike Shannon were together for a long, long time and made a terrific tandem. Uh, Jack was uh, the head of KMOX Radio on the sports side, and uh, so many people have come through there. Uh, uh, Charlie Slows and Bob Costas and Danny McLaughlin from, from the Cardinals broadcast years ago all worked at KMOX and all got their start there and all got the, the tap on the shoulder and the knighthood, if you will, uh, from Jack Buck. And he had such an amazing dry wit uh, he had such an amazing gravelly voice and a way of describing the game. And he had a, an amazing love and passion for the Cardinals, which, again, the genuineness uh, uh, shined through. And that's why people loved him for, for so long. And he left to go to the networks. And when that wasn't to his liking, he came back and was embraced back by the fans in St. Louis. So uh, for me, Jack Buck, if it's not been Scully and not a member of my family, Jack Buck. Can't go wrong with either one of those. If I could make you commissioner for the day, is there one rule that you would either add, change, or remove to make the game better in your eyes? Oh, boy. Uh, add, change, or remove. Um, it would have nothing to do with the game itself. I think that uh, we need dome stadiums. Uh, fans want to know that the game is going to be played. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think um, – you know, the arcane uh, uh, rainout rules uh, are, you know, the rainout scenarios. We had one in Pittsburgh yesterday where it starts raining. It rains hard for 10 minutes, stops. We sit there for an hour and a half and nothing happens. And then we go back and play. And then it starts raining again and we finish in the uh, I get why you can't do it, but I think dome stadiums for any new stadium that's built because you, you have to play the games and make sure that they're in. I think the baseball, uh, I guess I'll put it this way. When baseball begins to realize that the ballparks aren't ballparks, their TV studios, like the NBA did, I think we'll get to where our game really, really is uh, able to grow. 
Mm. Uh, better camera positions, better broadcast positions, more access, um, more more uh, 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 views, better sight lines, things of that nature, where we can really bring the game home to people who either can't afford or can't have the time off to come to the ballpark is really, really important. They do that in the NBA, and they do it exceptionally well, and I would love to see baseball adopt that approach a little bit more uh, stringently and more thoroughly because ultimately – We're in the entertainment business, and there are people who want to come but can't get there. And anything we can show, any better angle that we can show, instead of a box seat for an owner who's going to be there once a a month, uh, I think in the long run, we'll do a lot more help for our game than hurt on the bottom line. That's one man's opinion, though. No, I totally agree. Speaking of stadiums, favorite non-home stadium to visit? Oh, I love Wrigley. You know, I know it's going to make Cardinals fans crazy. I love going to Wrigley. (laughs) Uh, I don't like all the changes they made to it, but I understand why they did. I love Fenway Park. That one's great. Believe it or not, I like Marlins Park in Miami. Again, okay. there's a room. Uh, I also want to tip the cap to the, the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, Tropicana Field, it used to be dark and dingy and dull. They've done an amazing job of making that crazy place look yeah. and feel like a ballpark. Uh, it's bright. They do a great job with their game presentation. The people are happy and friendly. Uh, they win a lot of games. Uh, they've done an amazing job with that ballpark. And I know they get uh, dumped on quite a bit from the baseball traditionalists like me, but uh, they deserve a lot of credit. Chip, if a movie was made about you, who would you want to play <laughs> your character? Uh, I don't know the guy's name, but I've gotten this, uh, hey, you look like a lot. Uh, the dude that plays Phil Dunphy on uh, Modern Oh, Fantasy. for sure. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. look a lot like him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Phil Dunphy would be my guy, I think. Whoever that guy is. <laughs> Really, really funny. I love. It. <laughs> oh I, man, I get that quite a bit. I've gotten Jim Carrey a lot. Maybe yep. young, before I had all the gray hair, I got Gaston from the Disney movies one time. <laughs> uh, kind of weird. I don't know where that came from, but Phil Dunphy would be my guy. I think. Oh man, I can't. I can't picture a better one. Yes, Jim Carrey for sure. Like you said, when you were younger, yeah. but uh, Phil Dunphy for sure. He would hit yeah. on the head. Yeah, and I've got the same stupid sense of humor my wife says, so that might be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dad jokes. Everyone loves a good they're dad joke. When you're allowed to do them, they're the best. That's yeah. uh, It's supposed to be fun, right? Okay, well, now now I got a question. Being a new dad, when do dad jokes become uncool? What what age do they turn where you're like, okay, that used to be funny for you? They're never cool because they're never <laughs> uncool because as dads, we always think we're cool. In fact, I've got a dad joke for you right now if you're ready for one. Let's, let's do it. I'll bet you didn't know this. But 3.14% of all sailors turn out to be pirates. <laughs> See? All right, I've got one for you, Chip. Go. Bear walks into a bar, says, can I have a drink? Bartender says, what's with the big paws? Ah, oh, see? <laughs> right. That's it. It's supposed to be fun. Exactly right. And people are groaning at home, and they will, and they, but they'll, they'll remember it, and they'll repeat it, and that means you win. So it's all yeah. good. There you go. Best. All right. Last question of our 27th out. If you could go back to your 12 year old self and tell 12 year old chip anything, what would you say to him? Uh, Be a better athlete, be a better student, uh, strive to be a better person. Uh, You know, look, and and that's not to say I was a bad kid by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, you know, the old saying, if I could go back in time with the wisdom I have now, uh, the world would be a much better place. I think we would all say that, right? Um, I think I would probably try to uh, find the joy in things a little bit more instead of uh, the disappointments because there were plenty of them. Uh, and I would try to say, look, you're 12 years old. The world you know now is going to change seven or eight times before you turn 20. And it did. And if you believe that uh, your future is going to be better, you can manifest that self and you can make it happen. And I'm really, really proud of the fact that uh, despite the obstacles and, and hardships that I had that people don't understand, uh, I was able to, to fight through that. And uh, that there's a lesson in that, I hope, for someone out there that's listening. The world you're in now doesn't have to be the world you end up with. You can make it better, but you got to consciously try to do it. Put, it, put the work in, uh, build a village of wonderful people around you that uh, try to make you better and hold you accountable. And uh, if you do that, your circumstances will change and you'll find your dream, whatever it is, and you'll be a much happier person and in a much better place. I think that is a great place to end this. That is the perfect answer. And I just got to say, Chip, from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you for being on here, but also thank you for being a big reason of why I'm a huge baseball fan. You and Len Casper were the voices of my Chicago Cubs growing up. And I can say with a lot of confidence, when I was looking to become a broadcaster, all I could think of was your voice in my head because that was 
swung on and belted and <laughs> here comes the hook and all of these sayings, man, just were, were a lot of the inspiration of, of, you know, why even I wanted to start this podcast. I thought back to our conversation in San Diego and just like how cool it would be for people to be a fly on the wall hearing conversations like that. So thank you for all you do for the game and thank you for a big part that you played in my baseball fandom as well. Well, thank you. That was very kind. It was, it's a labor of love. Love what I'm doing. I love what I do. And uh, uh, the only way we can do what we do is to have great folks like you uh, sitting home and paying attention. I would get some help if my voice is in your head. You need to fix that ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> All good for good reasons, for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Chip. Very kind. Thanks so much. See you soon. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And, you know, I just want to say thank you for those of you that have continued to listen, for those of you that are even listening for the first time for making it through this entire episode. Uh, it, it would not be possible for me to see the traction that we've been seeing, to see the extra downloads, to see all the comments, to see all the things going on with this, uh, if it was not for you and your engagement. So if you haven't already left a review, if you haven't subscribed, if you haven't left a rating, please do that on whatever platform you're on right now. That would be huge, but please continue to share with friends, share with family, share with your other baseball people in your life. I hope that they enjoy it just as much as you do. And if there's anything about the show that you want me to take into consideration if it's a, a guest that you want to have on in the future if it's a question that i'm not asking that you want me to ask i want to hear from you so go ahead and engage with me in a few different ways you could do it on youtube with the comments you could do it through the reviews on apple or you could even email me kyle at setupman.net i want to hear from you on what we could be doing better again kyle at setupman.net next week we have joe migliaccio he's the hitting coordinator for the new york yankees interesting time for the yankees right now they had sean casey as their hitting coach recently he decided that he's not coming back uh there was a lot of really big struggles with the yankees overall as a hitting organization this last year so we're going to talk with joe a little bit about that we're going to talk about hitting philosophies as well and how much that goes into his job and really what what is a hitting coordinator right we hear all about hitting coaches but hitting coordinators what do they do so i really got deep into what that job description is as well so if you haven't already make sure that you go ahead and hit that notification bell on YouTube so that you know when we drop that next episode. But that's going to do it for me here on this week's episode of The Setup Man. I'm going to go ahead and put my arm on ice. We'll see you next time.